Vesterius Agilum. It's a two-player tactical strategy game where players are competing to take out the opponent's castle. But is this a game for you and your gaming group? We'll come on back after the break. Hey everybody, welcome out to the show, Board Game Reviews. This is a YouTube channel dedicated to the tabletop gaming hobby, and this video is part of a video series looking at Bestiary of Sigillum. Now, Bestiary of Sigillum is a tactical game as a team-based or a two-player game where players are controlling their summons. The basic objective is to use your summons to control catapults or to directly attack your opponent's summons. By doing so, you eventually weaken the opponent's level of their siege level for the castle. The first person to completely destroy the other person's castle is going to be the winner of the game. Or if you have me be playing the team game, the one who destroys the opponent's castles and reduces their siege level is going to be the team that's going to win the game. Now in this video, I'm going to give you a quick overview of exactly how the game plays. But if you want to see how the game itself fully plays out through a full played game or get my overview and my review of this game that is still in the prototype status, this is a game that actually isn't even out yet. This is a prototype of a game. But if you want to see what I thought about the game, check out the other videos in the series. Right now, let's go and cover exactly what the game of Bestiary of Sigillum is. Now, the game of Bestiary of Sigillum, the players are going to be summoners, basically who have their own castle. And your basic idea is your castle is attacking another player's castle. If you can, through your careful play, manage to bring your opponent's siege level all the way down to zero before they do the same to you, they're going to be defeated. You're going to win the game. Before the game even starts, though, you need to figure out if you're going to play on the three-unit board or if you're going to play on the four-unit board. Now, the four-unit board can be played as a two-player game, but if you can play teams, this is the only way to play the game, and you can break the teams down to each person on each team is going to control two summons for a total of four. On the standard board, it's going to be a two-player game, and either single player is going to control three of these summons. Now, before the game even starts, you need to look at the stack of many, many summons, multiple summons that all have different powers, but the interesting thing about this is every single player is going to pick three summons, and these are going to be the summons that are going to be available for your entire play of the entire game until win or lose, the game comes to an end. All these different summons have different powers, different abilities, different strengths, different weaknesses. Weaknesses as in the amount of hit points they have. But the interesting thing is all of these summons, their powers synergize with each other in different ways. Some of these summons may have the ability to stun. Some may have the ability to do damage to everything on the board that happens to be stunned. Some of them have the ability to knock out back, some of them have the ability to do different things, but they're going to do all these wonderful things to create this wonderful dynamic game, which is all a lot of strategy before the, even the game plays. If you ever played games such as Magic the Gathering or other deck building games, you know exactly what we're talking about here. You build the game before you even belly up to the table, and that's part of the strategy of the game. Now all these different summons are going to be part of different categories. You have your strength summons, which are more of your frontline fighters. You have your agility fighters or your agility summons, which are much more of your glass cannons, the ones who do much more direct damage, but they have a tendency to not be too durable. And then you have your intelligence summons, which are the ones that have the more of your more control and more of your support abilities. But beyond that, every one of these summons has different strengths and different weaknesses and different way they're going to play. And like I said, you're going to pick three summons and you're ready to play the game. After you have picked up the units that you're going to do, you simply slot them in these discs, bring out your powers that signify when you have used the powers because the cool thing about this game is you don't activate one unit and then do a couple things with it and then forget about that unit. Every one of your units, you can kind of mix and match how you're gonna do the things, kind of that Magic the Gathering reference I did earlier where you're gonna be making the combinations based on the summons you have out on the board. Because as long as your summons are on the board, you can split up the powers any which way you want. If I happen to have all three of my summons on the board, like a smart player should, I can use this power right here, and then I could use this power right here, and then maybe I may activate the powers of the dwarf over here, or maybe I may mix it up because the way I activate these powers and the way I do those different things is going to be influencing things. Because the thing I didn't explain about all of these powers is that the tokens that are associated with them also are part of the timer of the game. Because every one of these summons has our primary power, which they can use as many times as they want, but they also have their support powers. And these support powers, anytime they're used, they're going to go on the timer track over here. Different powers have different timer track requirements. Basically, the more powerful they are, generally speaking, the longer it takes for them to recharge. Every round during the light player's turn, the timer is going to advance one space. And if the timer advances to the point where one of your powers is pointed out by the arrow, 
that power finally gets to refresh and it's gonna be usable on your turn by your units. Again, allowing you to make those combinations to do those very cool things. And what are the cool things we're doing here? Well, the cool things we're doing here is we're trying to gain dominance and control these catapults. And we're also trying to attack our opponent's units because the way we're going to win the game, like I said, is by doing siege craft, doing enough siege damage to our opponent to defeat their castle. How do we defeat our opponent's castles? Well, there's two different ways we're gonna do this. One main way we're going to do this at the end of every single player's round, every round's broken down in a phase. The beginning of starting phase is the reset phase where we reset all of our powers, our primary powers. The timer is going to advance only on the, the light player side, not on the dark side player's turn because darkness. They don't refresh things at all because that's how darkness rolls. After we refresh all of our abilities that we can refresh and remove any tokens or debuffs we may have on our opponents, then we're going to go to the action phase. During the action phase, we get the chance to use all of our powers and our abilities in any combination, in any order we want. After we use all those abilities, then we're going to see what catapults we control on our turn. The way you control a catapult is by having at least one unit next to it or one unit on top of a catapult. If you have at least one unit or one unit on top of it, then you will control as long as you have more control over that catapult than your opponent. How do you factor control? Well, every single unit, every summon has at least one point of control. If you're the only person next to or on the catapult, then you control it. If an opponent happens to be next to it, then you're gonna be a push and nobody's gonna control that catapult. And if your opponent has more units on you than you do on that catapult on your turn, then that catapult is not gonna activate because the catapults only activate for you on your turn. Your opponent doesn't get to activate them. Well, there's different abilities you can use, powers that allow you to increase the amount of control you have. But like I said, if you have the most control of a catapult, that catapult is going to activate. Every catapult, as soon as it activates, if you have the control, for every catapult you control, it's going to do a point of damage to your opponents. Remember that other board I showed you earlier? This board has two catapults. This board has four. If you can really control those catapults, you're gonna start doing lots of damage to your opponents. But after your catapults activate and you damage your opponents, then your opponent gets the chance to go ahead and retaliate and do things that they wanna do. Again, starting out by refreshing any of their abilities, removing any buffs or debuffs that they put out on the prior turn, then activating their units by spending their powers, using their abilities, whether to do movement or to do attack or to do special powers that are gonna give them special abilities such as giving them haste, giving them extra defense, giving them extra attack, or giving them the ability to stun, the ability to poison, or the ability to slow down your opponents, or even the ability to make it so they lose the ability to have control, meaning that they don't have enough control, and now it's your turn to control all of these towers and use these towers to attack your opponent and take away their siege levels and do damage to them also. Now that's one way you're gonna do siege damage. The additional way you're gonna do siege damage is every one of these summons has a certain amount of hit points based on their size value. Small units or small summons only have two hit points. Medium sized summons have three or four hit points and then the large summons have five hit points. When a summon has taken its final point of damage that's removed from the board, it goes back to its board where it was come from and then you're gonna remove any debuffs on it. You're gonna remove any hit points of damage that were done to it. And then it's going to come back onto the board on that player's turn. You have to do it. It's not a choice you have. It's mandatory that you have to do that. The moment it comes back on the board, you have to take one point of siege damage. That's the resources you spend to bring that unit back onto the board. So now you have this way of winning the game twice by either using the catapults, controlling the catapults to attack your opponents, or is by going all out and attacking your opponents and wiping them out and forcing them to keep on losing their siege power until one person loses their last point of siege power, their castle is defeated, and they or their team loses the game. Now the great thing about this game is the amount of variety with all the different summons that come in the game, the strategy and the tactics of this game, of this very tactical strategy game, and the fact that you can play this as a smaller board or as a larger board or play as a team-based game. Now, if you want to see how the game actually plays out, you can check out my video where I do a full playthrough of the game, or you can find out my total review and my final basic opinion of this game. Now, I got to give it a caveat here when I talk about a review of this game. This is a game that is a work in progress. It is a prototype. Heck, it even says it right here on the components right here. This game is in prototype, so everything you're seeing here can and may possibly change, but from what I've seen right here, I think this is a really good basic level of where the game stands, how it looks, and how the game is going to play. So I think my review is gonna stand here pretty darn strong and exactly what I thought about the game. Check out the other video series. If you have any comments or any questions, make sure to leave them down in the YouTube comments down below. I'll do my best to answer them as quickly as I can. And also feel free to email me at off the shelf board game reviews. That is otsbgr at gmail.com. I'll do my best to answer those questions as quickly as I can. If you enjoy the content and you enjoy the channel, think about supporting the channel on Patreon. 
Just tossing one dollar in tip jar over on Patreon is a wonderful way to say thanks. No games, no gimmicks, no sponsors. Channel is 100% sponsor free, which means I can give you my unbiased opinions because nobody's paying me to tell you otherwise or talk about their product because they're paying me to do so. If you enjoyed this video, click that like button, click that subscribe button, and as always, thanks for watching.